Well, I grew up in a pastor's family. Many of you know that. And I like to say that one of the great blessings of my life is that I don't remember a single day when I didn't know about Jesus. But when I was eight years old, a guest preacher came to our little church in Akron, Ohio. His name was Dr. James DeWeird. He was a traveling evangelist, happened to be a friend of my dad's who he had known for several years. And even after 50 years, I can still remember he had a deep, booming voice, was just different than my dad, and then he told really cool war stories. Uh, He had served as a chaplain during World War II and was wounded twice on the same day. As I remember his story through the years, he was wounded while tending a soldier in battle, and then the ambulance he was in uh, to ride him off the battlefield was hit by a mortar shell, and he was wounded a second time. His wounds were such that during his recovery, he had to learn how to breathe out of one lung at a time to survive. I wasn't aware that was something you could teach yourself to do, but I guess under duress, you can. And it was a trick trick he could still do. He came to our house for uh, dinner that Sunday afternoon, and he told us the stories, and then he showed us how he could still do it. And sure enough, you could watch, and one half of his chest would go up and down. Then he'd switch to the other half. My brother was like not, was, uh, I was eight, my brother was like five. We thought that was the coolest thing we'd ever seen in our whole lives. And we spent all afternoon trying to do it, sitting in our rooms going... <laughs> We couldn't get it to work. But that uh, sermon, I still remember, somewhere during the sermon, he said one sentence. Dr. DeWeird said, you're not a Christian here today because your parents are. You're not a Christian here today because your parents are. And even though I was only eight years old, growing up in the church, I understood what he was saying. He was saying that even though my dad was the pastor of the church, even though I'd known about Jesus since the time I could understand human language, I was not a Christian until I made a personal decision about Jesus. So the next morning, my mother asked me what I was thinking about. I told her. We knelt on the floor of our living room at our home, and I prayed to ask Jesus to come into my heart. Now, I was only eight years old. I had a whole lot yet to learn about following Jesus, but I do believe my spiritual life began that day. Now, we're taking a four-week break from the book of Acts. I think you know that by now. We're doing a series out of the first 14 verses of John's gospel called God Reached Down, the advent of Christ. And so far, we've talked about God reached down through the Word. God reached down through the flesh. Next week, we're going to talk about God reached down through grace. But tonight, today, we're talking about God reached down through adoption. Of all things. Adoption. Let's read again John chapter 1, the first 14 verses. Look on the screens or open your Bibles to John chapter 1, and I'll read this for you. John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. First thing I want to talk about tonight, we see here in the middle of that passage, is what I'm calling the great decision. The great decision. Decision. My mom uh, grew up in the hills of eastern Kentucky in the mountains uh, and was the first person in her family to make a personal commitment to Christ. Uh, She was 19 years old, uh, heard the gospel preached in a little missionary church in the hills, in the the, the holler near her town. I think there were only nine people in the church the night my mother responded uh, to the invitation. The church was led by a missionary lady uh, who was also the preacher. She immediately, after receiving Christ as Savior, went back and tried to share the gospel with her family, and in particular with her grandfather, who was a crusty old mountain man that the family affectionately called Grandpa Joe. From the story my mom tells, Grandpa Joe was a former coal miner uh, and a binging alcoholic who would disappear for weeks at a time when he went on one of these binges. Uh, Then he would sober up 
come home, and then the whole process would start up all over again. Grandpa Joe. Sometime after my mom came to faith in Jesus, Grandpa Joe got very ill, had to be hospitalized. Turns out he was dying from black lung disease, as many miners did back in those days. My mom loved her grandpa, loved the stories he would tell. Even despite his behavior, she loved him. So she did her best to share the gospel with him. She urged him as best she could to confess his sins, to receive the grace and forgiveness of Christ. But Grandpa Joe was a proud, tough old mountain man. After some conversation, he finally looked at her from his deathbed, I'm not sure he ever left the hospital, and said to her, daughter, I'd be a coward to ask for forgiveness now. He said, i got to take what's coming to me. Grandpa Joe, sadly enough, made his decision. John here writes, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John is telling us here there are two kinds of people in the world, those who receive him and those who refuse him. John is saying that the central question in every human being, the central question we all must answer, the central question of all human history is, who is Jesus and what do I decide about him? Think about this. Here in the Western world, and indeed across most of the planet, we count our years from what scholars think is the birth date of Jesus in Bethlehem. All of human history is divided into B.C. and A.D., before Christ and Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. And therefore, every calendar, every cell phone you carry, every laptop computer, every tablet you look at, indeed, the very license plates of our cars and trucks bear silent witness to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I include resurrection in there because why else would the name of Jesus be remembered and marked? Why would we mark the years by his birth if that something extraordinary did not happen? at the end of his life. The Bible says the history of every individual life is divided the very same way. The eternal destiny of every soul hinges on the question, who is Jesus and what do I decide about him? Notice, John says that he came into the world and the world did not know him. And then he says he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. I think here John is saying there are two primary ways that people fail to acknowledge Jesus. First, there are those who sort of in general fail to understand or grasp who Jesus was and what he's come to offer them. This past week, President Obama gave a speech during the lighting of the national Christmas tree. You may have seen it. At some point during this speech, here's what he said, and I quote, it's the story of hope. The birth of a singular child into the simplest of circumstances. A child who would grow up to live a life of humility and kindness and compassion. Who taught us to care for the poor and the marginalized and those who are different from ourselves. And more than two millennia later, the way he lives still compels us to do our best to build a more just and tolerant and decent world. All that sounds good. It really does. It is good. Humility, kindness, compassion. But that's not the primary reason Jesus came. Not according to the Bible. John is saying that the world and people in general misunderstand, fail to grasp who Jesus is. And I believe it's possible that someone is here tonight, today, if you're at the worship cafe. That someone is here today and has always just thought of Jesus as being a great example of what we should be like. Kindness and tolerance. But really not much more than that. If that's true for you, I hope to change your mind, or at least challenge your mind by the end of this message in a few minutes. Second, John says, he came to his own people. Now, I think this refers not just to the the Jewish world where Jesus was born and raised, but to those to whom Jesus has approached personally, those who've heard the gospel clearly, and yet have chosen to reject Jesus' offer of forgiveness and salvation. People like my great-grandfather, Grandpa Joe who after hearing my mother explain, knowing what his life had been like, said, nope, i got to take what's coming to me. That's a direct rejection of Jesus. Now, whether through chosen ignorance or direct rejection, the Bible's very clear. God has revealed himself to all, and so all have to make a choice. 
Scripture says the most obvious way God revealed himself was through his son Jesus. In Hebrews 1 we read, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken by his son. Scripture goes on to say God's also revealed himself, not just through Jesus, but through creation, through the whole world that's around us, through all he has made. Romans chapter 1, Paul writes, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. It's clear. The Bible teaches every human being makes a choice. That choice can be framed in all kinds of different ways. People can choose to believe the universe was created by a transcendent and eternal God or that it happened by accident. People can choose to believe either there is a God or there is not a God. And if you choose to believe there is not a God, there are really no further significant questions to be answered because you can live however you want. There's no ultimate authority. There's no ultimate good. There's no ultimate accountability. It's just all survival of the fittest. But if there is a God, then there's a whole bunch of decisions to make. What's this God like? How do I know him? What's he expect of me? How do I live in relationship with him? The Bible says that God has revealed himself through Jesus, and therefore we must make a decision about Jesus. John says to make that decision, we must secondly receive and believe, he says. Receive and believe. One of the things I love most about ministry is getting to hear people's stories. Not just the stories of their lives, that's interesting, but it's really interesting to hear people's stories of faith. How do they come to faith in Jesus? How do they make that decision? We call them faith stories here. Maybe we call them gospel stories sometimes. And I've heard all kinds of stories. Some are sudden and emotional. Some are more gradual and kind of cerebral. Some are wildly unpredictable. But one of my favorites is actually one I read. And it's in uh, one of C.S. Lewis's book called Surprise by Joy. By the way, his birthday was, this past, was November 29th, just a couple of weeks ago. Lewis experienced a great deal of pain in his early life, a great deal of loss. And he decided in his early adulthood that if there was so much evil and pain in the world that a loving God just could not exist. So he was a practical atheist for many years. But through several key friendships, and much wrestling through his own thinking and, 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 and turmoil over a number of months, he describes his own coming to faith this way in one paragraph. Let me read it for you. You must picture me alone in that room in Magdalene, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted for even a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In a Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. I did not then see what is now the most shining and obvious thing, the divine humility which will accept a convert even on such terms. I love the honesty. I gave in and admitted that God was God. In other words, I resisted and I resisted. I ran from him and tried to deny his existence, but eventually... He overwhelmed me, and I gave in. I surrendered. I think it's also possible here today that someone has been resisting God. You're here. Maybe you're here to make someone you love happy. Maybe you're here out of uh, curiosity, or maybe you're here out of duty. But you're resisting. You're resisting the approach of one you earnestly desire not to meet. I want you to listen tonight. C.S. Lewis resisted through honest intellectual objection until at last he gave in. And there's the decision. It's what John calls receive and believe. He says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, a couple things I want you to notice here. Notice that John is saying that we are not born as children of God. Now, of course, in, in terms of just being human, uh, being created by God and being marked by his image, we are children of God in that sense. But that's not what John's talking about here. He's talking about salvation here. And with regard to our eternal salvation, we are not born children of God, he says. No one is born a Christian. Dr. DeWeird was right. You aren't a Christian here today just because your parents are. 
Jeff likes to say, God has no grandchildren. We're born alienated from God, the Bible says. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what hope do we have? Do we just then try to pile up as much good in our lives as we can to outweigh our sins? I think this is the go-to strategy of most people in our culture. I think most people think that if there is a God, what he wants most from us is just to be good people. You know, uh, be kind to your neighbors, care about the less fortunate, don't kill anyone, and hope for the best. That's the go-to spiritual strategy of most people in our culture. Now, those aren't bad things, and God certainly wants us to be good, It's just not the point of Christianity. I think it's very likely I've just described what someone here tonight has thought most of your life of what God wants from you. You know, I'm a pretty good person. He's going to be good with that, right? It sounds good, but it's just not Christianity. So if we can't pile up enough good deeds to earn our way into God's acceptance, what are we supposed to do? Be like Grandpa Joe, just got to take what's coming to me. John says there are two conditions to becoming a child of God, receiving and believing. What does it mean to receive and believe Jesus? These terms are often used interchangeably in the New Testament. As you read through it, you'll see both words, and here's what they mean. Receiving comes from a word that means to take, to lay hold of, to accept with initiative. It's not passive, but it's active. Let me give you an example. This past Wednesday, our entire ministry staff had our uh, annual Christmas lunch staff party. And as part of that party, it's traditional for us to have a white elephant exchange. So you get to the room, and everybody piles gifts up on a central table, and everybody gets a number. And when your number's called, you go up to the table, or you can trade a gift or whatever. But there can be all kinds of nice gifts. Some are gags. Some are really nice. But if you don't go up and take it when your number's called, it just stays on the table. It's not your gift. That's what receiving means, means, to take and receive the gift. Believing as in believing in the name, is a word that means to trust fully in someone or something. Let me give you another example. Let's say a couple of weeks from now or 10 days from now, you're on your way over the hills and through the woods to Grandma's house for Christmas. But your car runs out of gas and you get stuck on a country road. You have no choice but to try to hitchhike to a gas station to get gas to bring it back to your car. A farmer pulls up in an old beater pickup truck, offers you a ride. You have a decision to make, don't you? Your decision is, Do I trust him to take me to the gas station or not? Do you trust him enough to get into the pickup truck so he can take you? What exactly are we asked to receive and believe about Jesus? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. Here it is. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised in the third day according to the Scriptures. That's it. There's the Gospel. It means to believe that Jesus is who John says he is, the eternal word of God, God himself come in the flesh. It means to believe that Jesus came in the flesh so that he could die for our sins because without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. It means to believe that Jesus really rose from the dead to prove his authority as the Son of God as well as to guarantee our own victory over death. Furthermore, it also means to believe that you are and I am who the Bible says we are. That is, created in the image of God, but born into a dark world, broken by sin, and we ourselves are stained by that same sin. In fact, your sins all by themselves, just your little stack, my sins all by themselves, just my little stack, however big that stack is, would be enough to send Jesus to the cross. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It means to believe that without Jesus... We are separated from a holy God. We're still in our sins. To receive and believe is more than intellectual agreement with a set of theological statements. It's committing oneself to Jesus and all that that means. It means complete and unconditional surrender. It means not just believing the farmer and his pickup truck actually exist. I can believe that till the cows come home and never get into the pickup truck. It means to trust the farmer to get you to the gas station. It means to repent, to turn from everything else, to surrender, to trust, and then orient your life around his leadership and to follow. And there are two primary ways of receiving and believing. I call them point in time and process. Point in time, people hear the gospel, accept it, and they begin their spiritual journey with a decision. Process people often hear the gospel, question it, 
wrestle with it, sometimes for years, and then culminate their process with a decision. Now let me try to explain it a little deeper. Very often point in time people can point to a specific moment when they received Christ or came to believe. Maybe they attended a Billy Graham crusade. Maybe they um, walked to the front of a sanctuary to pray with a pastor. Maybe they stood in front of the Pacific Ocean and were overwhelmed by the magnitude of God's grace and fell to their knees and then baptized themselves right in the Pacific Ocean. I heard that story one time. A lady just ran into the water and baptized herself. She was so overwhelmed. But there's a clear moment of decision, often dramatic and often emotional. For process people, it's much different. Receiving and believing is more arduous. It's a long journey of learning and thinking and considering and questioning. Often I've found those with scientific backgrounds or engineering type brains to come to faith as a result of process. I've heard people say it took them 20 years to come to faith and they still couldn't point to a day or time. I think C.S. Lewis is a process story. He wasn't convinced quickly. It wasn't an emotional thing. Only after a long process of wrestling and questioning himself and truth and God. But then he surrendered. A process punctuated by decision. So I think it's really important for process people to drive a stake in the ground. At some point to say, here I stand. This is what I believe. Think about it this way. Think of a young man who's courting a young woman. The process of courting a young woman. At some point, that young man must do what? He must proclaim where he is. He must proclaim his love, his intent, his faithfulness. Sooner or later, she's going to ask, do you love me? And if he, if he says in response to that question, well, you know, I'm kind of in process. Not going to go so well. Now, so the spiritual decision might come at a point of baptism, might be writing out a faith story for membership here at FBCG, might be a decision made and anchored in a service of worship, which I'm going to give you a chance to do in just a couple of minutes. Thirdly, John says that the result of receiving and believing is to be born of God. Born of God. And here's where it gets, it gets exciting. It seems to me there are two ways to join a family. You can be born into that family. That is, you can have a biological relationship to your family. Or you can be adopted into a family without any biological connection whatsoever. And one of the things I think we almost always miss in the story of Jesus' birth is that the whole thing is about adoption. Adoption. Think about it. The Bible says Mary was with child by the Holy Spirit, which means not only does the Bible make the claim of virgin birth, not only was Jesus the Son of God, but Joseph was an adoptive father. Jesus was not his biological son. It also means that Jesus grew up in a blended family. Scripture tells us that Mary and Joseph went on to have other biological children uh, after they were married who would have technically been Jesus' stepbrothers and stepsisters. Blended family. But beyond all of that, the Bible tells us that Jesus came so that we could be adopted into God's family. Paul in Romans chapter 8 writes this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, it helps to understand here what Roman adoption was all about. First of all, there was a fundamental distinction in Roman culture between slaves and Roman citizens. Slaves had very few rights, were seen as property, weren't protected under the law. It was quite common for affluent but childless Roman citizens, couples, to adopt a slave, most often um, a young male slave, so that they could carry on the family name. And that process of adoption was very complex. It involved the cancellation of any and all debts of the slave being adopted, as well as complete change of identity. The slave, now become son, would receive a full share in the family inheritance, and once adopted, that bond could not be broken. Paul is saying here that through faith we are adopted children of God. Through faith in Christ we're no longer slaves to sin and the fear of condemnation, but now sons and daughters of a new father. Furthermore, our new position is confirmed by the Holy Spirit whose role is to remind us that we are 
indeed God's children. Now, I was not raised in an adoptive family, and I've never adopted a child, but I've known lots of adoptive parents here through FPCG. And over the years, I've come to see the, the beauty of adoption as a picture of the gospel. Think about it. An adoptive parent is not obliged to adopt a child, and yet they choose to do so. An adoptive parent is not obliged to sacrifice in order to give a, that child a life, yet chooses to do so. An adoptive parent is not obliged to open his or her heart in love to care for this child for the rest of their lives, but they do so. In the same way, God was not obliged. God was not obliged to reach down to us, to care for us, to sacrifice himself on our behalf, and yet he chose to do so in Jesus. We are adopted as children of God when we receive and believe on the name. And when we believe, we are born of God. Jesus says it this way, John chapter 3, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Over and over again in the New Testament, we see this process of spiritual rebirth described in 2 Corinthians. Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. In Ephesians, he writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. These texts point to two kinds of birth. There's spiritual birth and there's physical birth. The physical birth is a biological process where a child grows in a mother's womb. Uh, it, it usually is in, in, it includes intense labor pains, considerable mess, followed by great tears of joy. Spiritual rebirth doesn't involve the mother's womb, but does involve a labor process of repentance and confession, usually some mess involved, and then great tears of joy. Spiritual birth is not the result of a physical love between man and woman, but rather the love and the redemptive work of God who brings life from one's dead in heart. Now, here's how I want to wrap up. And this is the deal. If you hear nothing else, hear the next 45 seconds or so. The heart of the Christian faith is not about goodness or tolerance or compassion or service. The heart of the Christian faith is about death and resurrection. Some of you right now are going, but Pastor Brian, I think you got the, the holidays kind of mixed up. Death and resurrection, that's Easter time. This is Christmas time. Let's talk about the baby in the manger. Okay, let's do it. One of the big problems we have at this time of year is our cultural celebration of Christmas has cut the gospel out of the story. We've completely removed it from the story. The whole story begins how? Matthew's gospel. The angel comes and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what she has conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because what's the next line? He will save his people from their sins. There it is. That's the reason for the whole story. He will save his people from their sins. If they didn't need saving, he would not have come. If you didn't need saving, he would not have come. We wouldn't have the red tablecloths. We wouldn't have the trees. We wouldn't have the lights. We would have none of it. We wouldn't even count the years from his birth. But he came. The child in the manger is the man on the cross. The man on the cross died that you and I might live. The last verse of O Little Town of Bethlehem, we sang it tonight, says it well. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sins and enter in. Be born in us today. I ask you to bow your heads and quiet your hearts just for a moment. Almost ready to leave, but I can't preach this text honestly without asking a question. And here's the question Have you made your decision about Jesus? Maybe you've just always assumed that because you're a pretty good person, or because your parents went to church, or because your grandfather was a Baptist preacher, that that was enough. But tonight you realize that you have to make a decision. Or maybe you've been resisting. Maybe you've sensed his approach, his whisper, his knock on the door of your heart, and you've resisted with everything in you. But he knocks again tonight. Maybe you've been in process, thinking, questioning. But tonight, 
you're finally ready to surrender. If you want to make your spiritual decision, if you want to say, okay, I give in. You are who you say you are. And without you, I'm lost in my sin. Just lift your hand up briefly enough for me to see it because I want to pray for you tonight. Just lift it up briefly. Thank you. Thank you. It's a big decision. Don't make it just because I'm, I'm pushing you. Here's the prayer I want to pray. Pray it in your own heart. Lord Jesus, tonight, today, I receive you as Savior and Lord. I believe you died for my sins and rose again to give me eternal life. I surrender my heart, my mind, and my life to you. Lord Jesus, I thank you tonight for your word. Mostly, I thank you for coming at all. Because if we had not need saving, you would not have needed to come. None of it would have been necessary. Thank you tonight for those who have responded, who opened their hearts, and for those who still resist. I ask you to knock even more loudly in the days ahead. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.